After the Battle of Echnomus, the Carthaginians rallied at either Heraclea Manoa or Lilybaeum. Hamilcar sent Hanno to sue for peace with the Romans, although this was just to buy time. The Romans wanted to arrest Hanno in retaliation for Scipio Asina, but Hanno told the Romans that they would be no better than the Africans, and the Romans, flattered, let him go. The Romans who took part in the Battle of Agnomus had a brief period of rest and relaxation as the fleet was being repaired. The Romans eventually set out for Masana and Hanno returned to Carthage. Hamilcar will remain in Sicily and eventually will be recalled to Carthage to deal with the Romans there. The Roman invasion fleet reached Cape Hermia, now called Cape Bon, and sailed along the coast of the city called Aspis. On the map before you, it's called Apsis. The Romans captured and garrisoned the city and then sent word to Rome for further instructions. Rome sent word, and it was decided that one consul should remain in Africa with 40 ships, 15,000 infantry, and 500 cavalry. The consul Regulus would be in command in Africa, and the consul Manlius Vulzo will return home with the invasion fleet where he will celebrate a naval triumph. The generals in command of the Punic forces were Hasdrubal, son of Hanno, Bostar, and Hamilcar, who was now being recalled from Sicily. Hamilcar came to Africa with 5,000 infantry and 500 cavalry. Regulus began pillaging the countryside and eventually came to the city of Addis, where he besieged the city. The Carthaginian forces arrived and occupied a nearby hill, and the Romans attacked the Carthaginians, but the first legion was forced to retreat by the Punic mercenaries. But because the Punic forces ran too far forward, they lost the hill advantage. The rest of the Roman forces were able to get between them and the hill, forcing the Carthaginians to retreat. The defeat, followed by a Numidian invasion in the south, forced the Carthaginians to try and negotiate peace. But Regulus's demands were too much, so the war continued. A number of recruiting officers sent to Greece by Carthage returned with a large number of soldiers. A professional by the name of Xanthippus was among one of these soldiers. Xanthippus will retrain Carthage's forces and train them properly on how to use elephants effectively. Polybius says, the way in which he got them into order when he had led them outside the town, the skill with which he maneuvered the separate detachments and passed the word of command down the ranks in due conformity to the rules of tactics, at once impressed everyone with the contrast to the blundering of their former generals. The new Carthaginian army took the field most likely in May of 255 with 12,000 foot, 4,000 cavalry, and almost 100 elephants. Where the next battle took place is uncertain. All Polybius says is while the Carthaginians were marching through flat country. Nevertheless, the Romans engaged them. Xanthippus was put in charge of the army, and this is the first time the Carthaginian citizens were made to fight against the Romans. Xanthippus deployed his forces as such. Most of, if not all of the elephants, were placed in a single line in front of the whole force. The Carthaginian citizen phalanx were placed at a distance behind the elephants with mercenaries on their right. The most mobile of these mercenaries were placed with the cavalry in front of both wings of the infantry. The Romans' response to this was to place their light infantry in the front with the heavy infantry many maniples deep, and behind them the cavalry divided between two wings. How many maniples deep is up for debate. Regulus might have deployed his legions in six lines instead of the normal three to combat the elephants. Xanthippus gave the order to advance. The cavalry on both wings circled outwards and charged. The Romans responded by clashing their spears on their shield and shouting their war cry. They too advanced forward. The elephants charged, and those unlucky enough to be on the front line were trampled underfoot and pushed back. However, because of the depth of the Roman lines, they were able to hold formation for a short time. The left wing of the Romans charged forward towards the mercenaries on the Carthaginian right and routed them. Xanthippus rode up and down trying to rally his retreating men. In the end though, the Romans on the flank and rear soon found themselves having to engage the Punic cavalry, and those who managed to fight through the elephants were cut to pieces by the citizen phalanx. Whoever managed to find himself still alive was either trampled by the elephants or cut down by the cavalry. Regulus and a lot of 500 tried to escape but due to the flat open country found themselves soon taken prisoner. Only 2,000 men who were on the left wing who managed to rout the Punic mercenaries managed to escape back to Aspis. Everyone was killed, aside from the prisoners. On the Carthaginian side, 800 mercenaries were lost and so few from the cavalry and citizen phalanx that it was apparently not worth counting. Soon after the battle, Xanthippus returned to Greece to avoid the jealousy that would incur from the fact that he was a foreigner. Carthage then besieged Aspis, and once word got to Rome, they sent out a fleet under the consuls of 255, Marcus Aemilius Paulus and Cerberus Fulvius Paetinus, to recover the remaining survivors. Carthage was in the midst of repairing and rebuilding their fleet, eventually able to man a fleet of 200 ships to guard against any advances made against them. The Roman fleet was caught in a storm that blew them off course to the island of Cosira, where they ravaged the island. 
After this, they then engaged the Carthaginian fleet, where it was said that the Romans captured 114 Punic ships. Now, how many ships did the Romans have? Polybius says around 350 ships. However, this number is highly debated. It could have been as high as 504 ships, or as low as 210 ships. There are a lot of issues surrounding this figure, so for simplicity's sake, we will use the number 350. Now, for Carthage, they should have had more than 200 ships. If the figures from the Battle of Eknomus are correct, it is possible that some ships were stationed in Sicily, and what is even more plausible is that Carthage might have had trouble manning these ships. By this point, Carthage knew that any naval engagement with the Romans would result in boarding, so finding an additional 30,000 troops to man these ships might have proved difficult. On land, there may have been minor skirmishes and continued raiding, but all in all, the Romans abandoned their invasion got the remaining survivors of Aspis, and sailed home. Regulus, however, died in captivity. The invasion of Africa completely shattered the Carthaginian fleet. It would take five years before we hear of any naval operations from Carthage. Numidia, according to Polybius, invaded Carthage and dealt more damage than the Romans had done. The Carthaginian general Hamilcar was forced to conduct a ruthless campaign against the Numidians, crucifying the tribal chiefs of Numidia and Mauritania, as well as exacting 1,000 talents and 20,000 head of cattle from them. On their return home, the Roman fleet was caught in a catastrophic storm off the coast of Camarina, where only 80 ships escaped. Polybius describes this as the greatest disaster of sea, and if this is true, over 100,000 Romans and Italians would have perished. It is estimated that 15% of Italy's able-bodied men may have gone down in the storm. News of this disaster reached Carthage, and they were ecstatic. Carthage was now back on the offensive. They retook the island of Cosira and sent Hasdrubal, one of the generals elected to fight against Regulus, to Sicily with fresh troops and 140 elephants. The Carthaginian commander Carthalo, in 254, recaptured Agrigentum and destroyed the city. However, Rome quickly recovered by building 220 new ships in three months. However, there was no intention during this time of renewing the invasion of Africa. The consuls of 254-3 were Scipio Asina and Attilius Caetinus. They took their new fleet and after sailing to Masana and collecting the 80 ships that survived, sailed along the coast and besieged Kefalordion, Panormas, and Drapana. Carthalo, the Punic commander, was able to relieve Drapana, however Kefalordion, through treachery, was taken shortly after. The Romans besieging Panormas breached their walls and took the city. Scipio Asina was awarded a triumph for success. Caetinus was probably in command of the forces at Drapana, which is why he wasn't granted a triumph. The consul of 253 2 were Gnaeus Servilius Caepio and Gaius Sempronius Blizus. They made an abortive attack on Lilibaeum, before raiding Africa where Polybius says nothing worthy of note was accomplished. Blizus then took the fleet back to Italy, where he encountered a storm and lost 150 ships. The consuls of 252-1 were Gaius Aurelius Cata and Publius Servilius Geminus. The Romans, for the time being, abandoned the sea. For the next two years, only 60 ships were manned. Lepara, which had been besieged unsuccessfully three times before, was finally captured, and Therma was captured by the Romans where Aurelius was awarded a triumph. It is now most likely that Hasdrubal, son of Hanno, arrived in Sicily, even though Polybius dates his arrival to 255-4. The consuls of 251-0 were Gaius Furius Pacillus and Lucius Caecilius Metellus. Furius Pacillus, who was in Sicily, was sent back to Rome, leaving Metellus by himself in Sicily. Hasdrubal seized the opportunity to attack Metellus, and so besieged Panormus. In order to take Panormus, a concerted effort between the Punic fleet and Hasdrubal would be needed. And while Metellus was all alone with his legions at Panormus, a Punic fleet was sailing to help with the siege. However, they were unable to complete their task because Hasdrubal got absolutely crushed by Metellus. Metellus had stationed his light troops in front of a ditch he had dug outside the walls. They provoked Hasdrubal's elephants, who wanted to impress Hasdrubal, to attack and then ran into the ditch. Being showered with missiles, the elephants, wounded and confused, turned on their own troops. Metellus then ordered his legionnaires to assail Hasdrubal's army. Hasdrubal's army was massacred and all the elephants captured. Hasdrubal escaped only to be condemned to death and executed when he returned to Carthage. Metellus, on the other hand, was awarded a triumph in which the elephants captured were put on display. This defeat will put Carthage entirely on the defensive. The war will last another eight years, in which Hamilcar Barca, when he arrives, will start using guerrilla warfare operations against the Romans. The consuls of 250-40 were Gaius Attilius Regulus, the man who won the battle at Tindarus, and Lucius Manlius Vulzo, who celebrated a naval triumph for the Battle of Agnomus. 
The target for Rome was Lilybaeum, one of the last bases of operation for Carthage and Sicily. Rome had commissioned an additional 50 ships to be built, which brought the fleet up to 200 ships. In preparation for Rome's imminent advances, Carthage destroyed the city of Salinas, leaving only Lilybaeum and Trapana under Carthaginian control. The garrison of Lilybaeum numbered 7,000 infantry and 700 cavalry. An additional 4,000 troops will be sent under Adherbal and Hannibal, son of Hamilcar, during the initial stages of the Roman siege of the city, and during the siege itself, the number of defenders will rise to 21,000 through the efforts of Hannibal. Lilybaeum, which is now the modern Marsala, was at the most western tip of Sicily. It was founded in 396 and was defended by strong walls and towers with a ditch 90 feet wide and 60 feet deep, according to Diodorus. Its harbor was not large and was protected by the city's fortifications, and the only way into the harbor was through a narrow channel of navigable water through dangerous shoals. The Romans set up two camps, one on either side of the city, just like they had done at the Siege of Agrigentum. Hannibal, who had at first landed at the Agetes Islands with an additional 10,000 troops, waited for a strong winds before sailing into the harbor. Polybius writes, At last a strong breeze sprang up in exactly the right quarter. He crowded all sail and bore down before the wind right upon the entrance of the harbor, with his men upon the decks fully armed and ready for battle. Partly from astonishment at this sudden appearance, partly from dread of being carried along with the enemy by the violence of the gale into the harbor of their opponents, the Romans did not venture to obstruct the entrance of the reinforcement but stood out at sea, overpowered with the amazement at the audacity of the enemy. Once the troops were delivered, Hannibal will remain for a while, but will leave Lilybaeum and join at Herbal and Trapana. Himilco was the commander in charge of the defense of Lilybaeum. The troops consisted largely of Celtic and Greek mercenaries, as well as the remnants of the army at Panormus. Because of the dangerous shoals that required local knowledge to traverse through, Rome had trouble blockading the port. The fighting became fierce. Attempts by the Romans to take Lilybaeum by means of building battering rams, moving towers, catapults, and mines deep under the ramparts were unsuccessful. Their attempts to take the city were successfully parried by the Carthaginian defenders. At this point, the high-ranking officers of the mercenaries under Himilco slipped out and parlayed with the consul. However, a mercenary by the name of Alexon knew what they were doing and told Himilco, who managed to convince the mercenaries to continue fighting for him. A western gale arose during the fighting, and the Carthaginian defenders were able to set fire to the Roman siege works, which spread to the others, basically destroying all they had built. The failure of the Romans to take Lilybaeum forced them into a passive siege. Seeing the success of their defense, Himilco took the opportunity to attack the Romans. However, seeing that his sortie was failing, he ordered the retreat. It is at this point Hannibal will leave Lilybaeum to join Hadherbal. There was a man by the name of Hannibal the Rhodian who was able to get past the Roman ships trying to blockade the port of Lilybaeum and delivered news to and from Carthage. This kept Carthage informed as well as kept up morale for the defenders. However, his luck ran out as he was eventually captured by the Romans. The Romans also began to suffer from difficulties in maintaining a steady supply for their forces and they began to suffer from sickness derived from eating infected meats. Rome decided that it was time to regain command of the sea. They had 123 ships at Lilybaeum, however a good portion of the crews had died, and so they had difficulty in manning them. But they also had about 120 ships, which was commanded by Unius Pullus in Messana. However, at Herbal in the city of Trapana, commanded a powerful fleet that lay between Pullus and the forces at Lilybaeum. Because of this, the Romans sent 10,000 troops on land to reinforce Lilybaeum. One of the new consuls for 249-8 was Publius Claudius Pulcher, a man who is said to have, with pride and contempt, ground down his legions. Claudius was able to gain volunteers to man the ships at Lilybaeum, and with full support of his military tribunes and senior officers, decided to strike at Trapana. His strategy was to make for Trapana at night as to arrive there in the morning, hoping to take at Herbal by surprise while his ships were still docked and anchored. By this time, it was almost safe to say that Rome had abandoned the Corvus, this most likely happened after one of the storms had wrecked their fleets, or even after the battle off Corsaira, which shattered the Carthaginian fleet. Claudius had about 120 ships, while Herbal had more or less 130. There is a story in which I would like to read to you about Claudius Pulcher. Before the battle, Claudius conducted the auspices. An auspice is the observation of and divination from the actions of birds. This story is from Cicero's On the Nature of the Gods. Cicero writes, Shall we be unmoved by the story of the recklessness of Publius Claudius in the First Punic War? Claudius merely in jest mocked at the gods. When the chickens on being released from their cage refused to feed, 
he ordered them to be thrown into the water, so that they would not eat, they might drink. But the joke cost the jester himself many tears, and the Roman people a great disaster, for the fleet was severely defeated. Adherbal got wind of Claudius' approach, and took his fleet to engage Claudius. He attacked from seaward, and Claudius fled with 30 of his ships. The other 93 were captured. Adherbal had nothing to fear from the Romans, now that Corvus was gone, and since he was attacking from the sea, he had more space to maneuver, while Claudius and his fleet was pressed to the shore. After this victory, Adherbal sent his prisoners and captured ships to Carthage, which was a sight for sore eyes to say the least. Carthalo, the former Carthaginian commander in Sicily, arrived with 70 ships. Adherbal gave him another 30, and Carthalo was ordered to attack Lulibaeum, to deal with the remaining fleet there. Carthalo attacked at dawn and did some damage, while Kimilcoa launched an attack from the city against those trying to rescue their ships. Carthalo then sailed to Heraclea to attack Roman supply ships sent by Ionius Polis to Lilibaeum. But because the supply ships knew of Carthalo's coming, they anchored offshore and defended their ships. Carthalo was only able to capture a few of them. However, Polis was arriving with the main fleet. But when Carthalo approached, Polis took refuge onto the shore. A storm was approaching which Carthalo was informed of by one of his men, and he retreated to avoid the storm. And the Roman supply ships and Polis's fleet was completely destroyed. This defeat caused Rome to abandon the sea, but we cannot fully blame Claudius for this disastrous defeat of over 75% of his fleet being captured which led to a series of victories for the Carthaginians. The chickens are surely to blame. Rome took news of Claudius' defeat personally. Claudius was prosecuted for treason by two tribunes, but he was acquitted. But he was brought to trial again on a lesser charge and succeeded in getting him fined 120,000 asses. Claudius, despite Rome, when called upon to nominate a dictator to take control of the situation he created, Claudius nominated a lowborn, possibly a freeman, since he bore the name Marcus Claudius Galicia. He was a scribe and was forced to abdicate, and he was replaced by the experienced Attilius Caiatinus, and he nominated Caecilius Metellus as master of horse. Ionius Pullus survived and maintained the siege at Lilibaeum. Pullus tried to recover the situation by taking Mount Eryx, which overlooked Japana. With Rome's navy out of the picture, and Carthage having a strong fleet of 170 ships, one would expect Carthage to press the attack with their newfound advantage, to make use of their navy and control the sea, attacking southern Italy where Rome's hold was new and weak, and regaining lost ground in Sicily, especially lifting the siege of Lilibaeum. Rome herself was nearing bankruptcy and exhaustion. Carthage evidently did not make use of this new opportunity, which if they had done would have won them the war against Rome. Some scholars say that it was because of unrest and wars in Africa that had forced Carthage to focus on the mainland rather than reinforcing Sicily, that from Regulus' invasion of Africa had caused a series of unrest along with the actions of Hamilcar against the Numidians, which caused further unrest. However, this is not the case. Carthage, as we have seen, sent reinforcements to Sicily in 252 after Regulus' invasion, as well as raising a fleet of 170 ships, which required a lot of manpower. There might be an answer as to why Carthage failed to press the attack, and that is a change of policy. Sometime between 247 and no later than 241, Carthaginian commander Hanno the Great was conquering lands most likely at the furthest extent of Carthaginian territory, in Algeria, and by 241, he was apparently commander-in-chief in Africa. Other events that lead to this theory is that Adherbal is never mentioned again after 249, and Carthalo after 248-7 and by 242, the Carthaginian fleet had gone back to Africa. The fleet from 247 onwards was allowed to atrophy. Carthage evidently followed the policy of Hanno the Great of extending Carthaginian territory in Africa, which means that they might have believed that they had already won the war against Rome. This was most definitely argued against by Hamilcar Barca, who will become the commander of Sicily in 247. If Carthage did have a change in policy, Hamilcar would have argued for an aggressive strategy against the Romans, hence why he was sent to Sicily and his aggressive efforts against Rome when he arrived. Hamilcar Barca will have kept both Drapana and Lilibaeum under Carthaginian control until the end of the war. So continuing, Carthalo continues naval operations in 248, retaking Agilathos near Drapana, and Carthalo will be replaced by Hamilcar Barca in 247, and Carthalo will attempt a series of raids on Italy but to no effect. On his return home to Africa, Carthalo's mercenaries mutinied, whereby Carthalo marooned a number of them. They mutinied because of a lack of pay, but the fact that only a number of them were marooned may indicate that they were needed in Africa, which means that Hamilcar Barca was now faced with a reduced fleet and a reduced army. 
A quick side note, Hannibal Barca will be born around this time of Hamilcar's arrival to Sicily. Hamilcar's first move against the Romans was raiding Italy, where he ravaged the territory of Locri and Brutium. On his return from Italy, Hamilcar conquered Hercte, which lied between Eryx and Panormus, near the sea in Sicily. This would become his base of operations, which provided great protection and defense from future attacks. The next three years we know very little, as they were only summarized by Polybius. What we do know is that the Romans set up a base one mile from Hamilcar's new base. And then Hamilcar raided the territory of Catana, which if true, shows how far-reaching his raids were while command at sea. In 244, Hamilcar, feeling the pressure from isolation and realizing he couldn't take Panormus, moved his base to Eryx, which he conquered from the Romans, which protected Drapana. For two years, Hamilcar maintained his new base at Eryx. In 243, Rome decided to build a new fleet. By this time, it is assumed that Hamilcar did not have a navy since we hear nothing about it after his raid on Katana. Rome was financially broke. They had to rely on loans from private individuals with the promise of repayment upon victory. In this way, they were able to finance 200 quinquiremes. Command of the fleet was entrusted to the consul of 242, Gaius Lutatius Catullus, and the praetor Urbanus Quintus Valerius Falto. The other consul, Postumius Albinus, was forbidden to leave Rome because he was part of an important priesthood. Catullus descended upon the harbor at Trapana and the anchorages of Lulibaeum. Trapana was now besieged. Carthage took about eight or nine months to respond to these events, and there's a lot of debate as to why Carthage took so long. But for the sake of argument, it may have been because Carthage could not find enough men to man their 250 ships. And by the time they sailed for Sicily, they were probably undermanned. The Carthaginian commander for this was Hanno, and this was probably a new Hanno. It could have been the Hanno who was defeated at Agrigentum and Agnomus, but seeing how Carthage dealt with failure, it is unlikely. Hanno's intention was to reach Eryx undetected to gather Hamilcar's mercenaries to be the marines on the ships before engaging the Romans. However, Lutatius, who was alert to Hanno's fleet, engaged them before Hanno could pick up Hamilcar and his men. The result was a victory for the Romans with no losses. 50 Punic ships were sunk and 70 captured. When Hanno returned to Carthage, he was crucified. When news from Carthage finally reached Hamilcar, they granted him full powers. Truce was now under discussion, and Hamilcar's one bargaining ship was that Lutatius probably wanted to end the war as soon as possible before his term was up. The terms of surrender were thus. Carthage was to abandon all of Sicily and all the islands between Sicily and Italy. They were not to make war on Hiero and Syracuse, as well as neither side was not to interfere, attack, recruit from, or make alliances with the other's allies. Carthage was forced to pay an indemnity of 3,200 talents, about 83 tons of silver, over 10 years. This long war has now come to an end. But this was not truly the end. In 237, a young boy at the age of 9 joined his father in Spain and this boy was Hannibal Barca. Hamilcar Barca personally felt that he was never truly defeated, and as Polybius says, is one of the reasons for the causes of the Second Punic War. Another reason, he says, is Hamilcar's wrath.